Usually, for my St. Patrick's Day videos, I tell a story from Irish myth and legend. Stories of brave men, Celtic gods and heroes. But this is my St. Patrick's Day video for 2016. A special year for Ireland as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 1916 Easter Rising. Of Easter week, April 1916, when 1,200 Irish men and women rose up against the might of the British Empire in a strike for Irish freedom. So instead of a magical mythical tale, I thought it best for this year to tell a historical story. While it may not be one about Celtic gods, it is still a story of many brave Irish men and women who in the eyes of many today are certainly seen just as much heroes and legends as those spoken of in our ancient folklore. But before we speak of the Rising itself, we must first take a quick look at the historical context that would lay the foundations in order to better understand the Rising. Starting at 1171 AD, King Henry II of England travels to Ireland with the blessings of Pope Alexander III to wage a war of conquest and would begin centuries of occupation, oppression, and bloodshed. Many battles and wars would be fought between the Irish and the English, and in an effort to prevent and limit more rebellions, England decided its best course of action would be to increase the number of people in Ireland loyal to the Crown by moving British people to Ireland. This would become known as the Plantations, when large amounts of Irish land were given as rewards to British politicians and military officials for their service to the Crown, granting them titles and making them landlords. The largest of which was the plantation of Ulster in the north of Ireland throughout the 17th century. And this was also the beginnings of the religious divide in Ireland, as the native Irish were predominantly Catholic and the British landlords and settlers predominantly Protestant at the time. But the rebellions continued, and to enforce control further, Britain would withdraw basic civil rights from the Irish Catholic population, making them second-class citizens in their own country, creating an even more unequal society when built on conquest, oppression, and the slavery of the native people. In 1798, an Irish Republican called Wolf Tone would form the United Irishmen, and would lead a rebellion of tens of thousands against British rule, inspired by the American and French revolutions. But after four months of bloodshed, his Irish revolution fails. In 1801, Britain would pass the Act of the Union to fully incorporate Ireland into their United Kingdom. But as Britain would look further to build its empire across the world and would grow richer, Ireland was left behind to stagnate. Society allowed to decline, and the class divide of rich and poor widens, and poverty would grow more and more, which would eventually see Ireland come to have the worst slums in Europe in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This was made even worse come the 1840s in the Great Potato Famine, where the Irish Catholic population, whose main source of food at the time was potatoes, were left to starve with no support or help from the British government. Landlords loyal to Britain who had other crops kept for themselves or sold to England with little or none left to feed the Irish population. Millions would die and millions more would emigrate over the years, and to this day, Ireland is one of the few places on earth that has a lower population now than it did in the mid-1800s. In 1848, the Republican movement would receive a tricolour from France, of green, white, and orange. Green symbolizing the Catholics, orange symbolizing the Protestants, with white in the middle symbolizing peace. It was also around this period when an underground Republican movement called the Irish Republican Brotherhood, or the IRB, would begin to make its voice heard in the bid for Irish freedom. Come the early 20th century, in 1910, when a British general election would see a stalemate between Liberals and Conservatives, John Redmond, leader of the Irish Party, would make a deal to support the Liberal Party to help put them in government in return for Home Rule in Ireland. 
Home rule would give Ireland its own parliament, with limited powers of government, but all major influence would still be controlled by Britain. For Republicans in Ireland, nothing short of full independence from Britain would be enough. For Protestants in Ulster, however, Home Rule was seen as a betrayal of them as they feared a parliament in Dublin would be controlled by Catholic interests. This would see the birth of the Ulster Volunteers, a militia group that would fight to remain wholly part of the UK. And in turn, the Irish Volunteers were formed who supported Home Rule. A young teacher and poet named Padraig Pearce would climb the ranks of the Irish Volunteers and would eventually join the IRB. In 1913, a large-scale industrial movement centred on workers' rights and workers' rights to unionise known as the Dublin Lockout would see the rise of socialist leader James Connolly. The lockout would last from August 1913 to January 1914, and Connolly would form the Irish Citizen Army to protect striking workers during demonstrations from police interference. However, world events would soon come into play. And when the First World War broke out, all plans for Irish Home Rule were suspended by the British Parliament. This caused a split to occur in the Irish Volunteers. The majority believed they should join the war to help fight for the freedom of other small nations, that they might come back as a fully trained Irish army, and under the belief that helping end the war would help get Home Rule back on the table for Ireland. Other Irish Volunteers, such as Thomas Clark, believe this would present the most opportune moment to strike while Britain was distracted with the war in Europe. In 1915, at the funeral of Fenian leader Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, Padraig Pearce was chosen to speak as he represented the newer, younger Republican generation at the time. The most remembered part of this speech was when he declared that Ireland on free shall never be at peace. Now we finally reach 1916. The IRB, Irish Citizen Army, and the Irish Volunteers that remained in Ireland would join together in a combined effort to plan an Easter Rising. They were also joined by Cumann Naman, the Irish Women's Council, a Republican women's parliamentary organisation who believed in equal rights for women as well as the freedom of Ireland. The plan was for Irish volunteers to march on Easter Sunday parades that would be held all over the country, and once in position, would then storm and capture strategic buildings and areas, holding the country until Britain was forced to relinquish control of Ireland while it was concentrated on the war effort in Europe. To help bolster their arms supply and to better their offensive plans, the rising leaders also took to the old phrase of, the enemy of my enemy is my friend and attempted to gain weapon supplies from Germany. Sir Roger Casement had brokered a deal with the Germans for weaponry and accompanied the shipment on the journey back to Ireland. However, on Good Friday, April 21st, 1916, the vessel was intercepted and captured. Its captain would set off explosives to sink the ship so that it would not fall into enemy hands. Roger Casement was arrested by British forces and would later that year be executed as a traitor in August 1916. When Owen McNeill, leader of the Irish Volunteers, heard of the loss of the German weaponry, he sent out a countermanding order throughout the country that there would be no parades and that Irish Volunteer marches planned for Easter Sunday were to be cancelled. But the IRB leaders decided to go ahead with their plans on Easter Monday instead. However, on such short notice, they were unable to get word out throughout the country. As a result, the bulk of the Easter Rising would be fought in Dublin. A proclamation for Irish independence was drafted and signed by the Rising leaders, proclaiming an Irish Republic with Padraig Pearce as president. And on Easter Monday, April 24th, 1916, battalion of Irish volunteers and Irish citizen army gathered outside Liberty Hall and marched as if on parade towards Sackville Street, now called O'Connell Street. Their objective, the GPO, the General Post Office. Central in their plan as to control the GPO would allow them to control or at the very least hinder 
lines of communication between Dublin and the outside world. After the GPO was captured, Baudric Piers stepped outside and read the Proclamation of Independence, declaring the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland, and that the Republic would guarantee religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens, and that the Republic would cherish all the children of the nation equally. A small crowd had gathered, curious as to what was going on, but none realised or fully understood what Pierce and his men were trying to accomplish. This is an important factor, because in general, a lot of the regular citizens of 1916 were actually okay with how things were at the time, especially as many of them had family members fighting in the British Army in the trenches of the First World War. Britain actually had the majority of public opinion on its side at the start of the Rising. Other strategic areas that were captured in Dublin included the Four Courts, the South Dublin Union, Boland's Mill, St. Stephen's Green, and the Jacob's Biscuit Factory. An attempt was made to capture Dublin Castle, then the seat of British power in Ireland. A police officer, Constable O'Brien, had refused to allow entry for the rebels, and although he was unarmed, he was shot and would become the first casualty of the Rising. The gates to Dublin Castle were closed and the rebels would begin to receive fire from soldiers inside. They fell back to City Hall, a building next to the castle, but unknown to them, Dublin Castle was actually seriously undermanned at this time. One strategic error in the plans for the Rising, however, was that none of the train stations or ports were captured, which would allow for the eventual arrival of reinforcements of British troops. On the second day of the Rising, Dublin City was in chaos, and the Dubliners themselves, who lived in some of the worst conditions in Europe at the time, began looting shops. This disheartened rebel leaders as they had hoped once the Rising began, regular citizens would begin to join them in their bid for freedom. One rebel leader, Sean McDermott, tried to appeal to the looters, asking them not to disgrace this battle for Irish freedom, but he was ignored. Martial law was then declared by the British Army, led by Brigadier General Lowe. Later that evening, a pacifist named Francis Sheehy Skeffington, who was attempting to stop looters, was arrested on his way home by British forces under the command of a Captain Bone Coldhurst. He was arrested for no obvious reason. The next morning, Wednesday, April 26, 1916, the third day of the Rising, Francis Shi Skeffington, along with two journalists who were actually pro-British, Thomas Dixon and Patrick McIntyre, were shot dead by firing squad on the orders of Bone Coldhurst. Captain Bone Coldhurst would later attempt to cover up, raiding Skeffington's home, looking for something to try to incriminate and link him to the Rising. Britain would also attempt to cover up these events, and later Bone Coldhurst was sent to spend just 18 months in an asylum and later allowed to retire to Canada with full pension. April 26th was also the day of the first arrival of British reinforcements. A regiment known as the Sherwood Foresters who arrived at Queenstown Port, now called Dunleary, and would begin to march towards Dublin City. As they marched past the RDS, they were actually applauded by the general public. But they would soon reach Grand Canal, near which Eamon de Valera and his men had captured Boland's Mill and taken up positions aiming at Mount Street Bridge, where the Sherwood Foresters would have to cross. Effectively, the Sherwood Foresters had marched themselves into a bottleneck, and not wanting to show weakness in retreat and attempting to cross from another bridge, Brigadier General Lowe ordered that Mount Street Bridge be taken at all costs. Needless to say, this led to a massacre of the Sherwood Foresters who had no cover on the bridge and could not see where shots were coming from. The British also sent the gunboat Helga up the River Liffey, which runs through the centre of Dublin 
where it would first demolish Liberty Hall, and then make its way up the river to take position to allow it to fire on Sackville Street and the GPO. On Thursday the 27th of April 1916, James Connolly, while commanding troops outside the GPO, was hit in the leg by a ricocheting bullet and was unable to walk for the rest of the Rising. General Sir John Maxwell, who was sent from London with more reinforcements, arrived and by Friday the number of British troops in Dublin had swelled from just 1,000 to 16,000. On Friday the 28th of April 1916, the Battle of North King Street. Like that on Mount Street Bridge, British forces were forced into a bottleneck and would begin to suffer heavy losses. Brigadier General Lowe ordered that no rebel was to be taken prisoner, though more civilians would take the consequences of this order. By late that Friday evening, angered and frustrated with the losses suffered, British troops began to break into civilian homes on the street and with no regard for those inside, took over their homes and would begin tunneling through adjacent building walls, one after the other, in an effort to advance up the street. These actions would also see the British troops kill 15 civilian men in their homes by gunshot or bayonet. With the help of makeshift armoured cars, the British were eventually able to make their way up North King Street forcing the rebels there to fall back to the four courts. By this time, Sackville Street had become ablaze with fire from the shelling fired from the gunboat Helga on the River Liffey. And as the GPO began to burn, the rebel leaders inside had no choice but to abandon the building and attempted to retreat to the four courts garrison. But they ended up stuck in the buildings on Moore Street in the process carrying the injured James Connolly on a stretcher. At the start of this retreat, the first group of volunteers to charge up Moor Street was led by the Arahali, one of the rising leaders. He would be shot twice during this charge, but did not die instantly. He managed to crawl to a laneway that intersected with Moor Street and found shelter in a doorway, but it would be here he would spend his last moments as he would eventually succumb to his injuries. But before he died, he wrote one final letter of farewell to his wife that was found on his body after the fighting. A replica of this letter, made in stone, hangs as a memorial in that same laneway, which is now called O'Rahilly Parade. The O'Rahilly would be the only rising leader to die during the Rising. Come the morning of Saturday, 29th of April, 1916, Dublin City was reduced to ruins. General Lowe's troops had cordoned off the city centre and had taken control of Dublin. From his position in Moore Street, Audrey Pierce would begin to see the consequences suffered by the civilian population. One scene he is said to have witnessed was of three dead civilian men laying on the street, each holding white flags. Pierce and the other leaders decided that they would save further civilian lives and ordered an end to the Rising. They sent nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell from their position on Moore Street, carrying a white flag and a letter of surrender to Brigadier General Lowe, requesting fair conditions for their men. But the Brigadier General would accept nothing less than an unconditional surrender. At 2.30 p.m., after six days of bloodshed and six days of an Irish Republic, Audric Pierce meets Brigadier General Lowe, gives up his sword, and with it, the unconditional surrender of the provisional Irish government and army. Word was spread of Pierce's orders, and all other battalions around the city would begin to stand down. When British troops were rounding up the rebels, the women of Cumminamon were told that they could go home. But they refused, and demanded that they be arrested alongside their brothers in arms. The rebel leaders and prisoners were held in Kilmainham Gale, 
exception of the injured James Connell. After a court-martial trial, General Sir John Maxwell wanted to make an example of him in what he believed would demonstrate the might of Britain and help deter any further rebellions or retribution from the Republicans and sentenced the rebel leaders to be executed by firing squad. Some leaders managed to avoid execution, such as Eamon de Valera, because he was born in America, and Constance Markievicz, leader of Common Naman, because she was a woman. The executions began on May 3rd, 1916 in Kilvainham Gale. The first to be executed were Baldrick Pierce, Thomas Clark, Thomas McDonough, May 4th, Joseph Plunkett, Edward Daly, Willie Pierce, Michael O'Hanran. May 5th, John McBride. May 8th, Eamon Kent, Michael Mallon, Sean Houston, Kion Colbert. May 12th, Sean McDermott, and finally, James Connolly, who was shot tied to a chair as he could not stand due to his injury. Now, remember earlier when I had mentioned that during the Rising, the bulk of public opinion was actually on the side of the British troops. As the executions began and slowly continued so close to the end of the fighting, public opinion would begin to change, and the people began to see those being executed as martyrs, of people who were dying for something, dying for a cause, dying for freedom of an Irish Republic. General Maxwell had intended to deter any future rebellions, but instead his show of force had the opposite effect and caused the ideals of republicanism to grow stronger and more widespread amongst the general public, turning public opinion even more so against the British. The rising itself may have failed, but the sacrifice of its leaders would soon see their dream of a free Irish Republic become the dream of even more Irish men and Irish women eventually leading the War of Independence, while the Ireland of today may not be 100% the Ireland envisioned by those brave men and women who gave their lives on that historic Easter week in 1916. It was not solely a vision based just on the amount of land that would gain independence, but it was also a vision for an Ireland where its people would have equality in all its forms, and that we may be oblivious to differences such as those of religion, which were and continue to be used as causes of divide, not just in land, but amongst the people. And while we have made some progress towards that dream, 100 years later, there are still many aspects of that equality that for now, still remain a dream for many. If you visit the GPO on Dublin's O'Connell Street today, you can still see bullet holes in the pillars and the front walls of the building from the battle 100 years ago. And to the north of O'Connell Street, you can find the Garden of Remembrance, a memorial garden dedicated to the memory of all those who gave their lives in the cause for Irish freedom.